Good afternoon all. Good afternoon. Hello and welcome to the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of the West Indies. I am Marsha Ivey, lecturer in public health and the Associate Dean for Public Relations in the Faculty of Medical Sciences here at the St. Augustine campus. Today I will be your moderator for this lunchtime lecture series brought to you by the Faculty's Advisory Committee on Entrepreneurship. We welcome our guest lecturer, Professor Martin de Souza. We also welcome our one UWI family from across our five campuses, members of the general public here in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean region and those further afield. Our program today will be very short in terms of we will start out by with opening remarks from Professor Donald Simeon, the director of the Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Development to deliver um, the opening remarks. Then we will have Dr. Professor D'Souza deliver the lecture, followed by the vote or question and answer segment, and then the vote of thanks. The, our guest lecturer will be introduced by Dr. Sandy Miraj. So at this time, without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Professor Donald Simeon to bring the opening remarks. Professor Simeon. Thank you, Marsha. One of the highlights of the strategic plan of the University of the West Indies, that is the UWI AAA strategy, is the promotion of innovation and entrepreneurship. Each faculty across the five campuses has established an INE committee. As the chair of the Faculty of Medical Sciences Advisory Committee on Entrepreneurship, I am pleased with the work that we are doing facilitated through the faculty's Entrepreneurship and Business Transformation Office led by Dr. Sandeep Maraj. One of our initiatives is the hosting of a lunchtime lecture series towards fostering a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship among students and members of staff in the faculty. We have had several very exciting presentations by persons who have led in the area of medical innovation and entrepreneurship. This afternoon's talk is also being co-hosted with the Community of Practice for Health Policy and Systems Research. This community is based at the Caribbean Center for Health Systems Research and Development and has, and has over 100 members from 13 Caribbean countries. It has been hosting a monthly discussion series since February of this year, where a guest would present on a topic of health policy and health systems importance and engage members of the community, that is researchers, policymakers, and other stakeholders in the discussion. Having read Professor Martin J. D. Souza's resume, we are in for a treat today. As the endowed chair of pharmace pharmaceutics at the Vaccine Nanotechnology Lab at the Center for Drug Delivery Research at the College of Pharmacy in Atlanta, Georgia, he is a perfect example of a research scientist leading in innovation and entrepreneurship towards the strengthening of health systems. An inexpensive and painless method of vaccine delivery through a micro needle patch has tremendous potential for developing countries, especially as we struggle with the administration of COVID-19 vaccines. Such innovations also have implications for policy development. So on behalf of the Faculty of Medical Sciences Advisory Committee on Entrepreneurship, and a community of practice for health policy and systems research, I welcome Professor D'Souza, as well as our other distinguished guests, colleagues, and students who are attending this lunchtime series. I look forward to your presentation, Professor. Ms. Ivy. Thank you, Professor Simeon, for those um, very brief opening remarks that just touched on everything that we need to know to go into this lecture. At this time, I'm going to invite Dr. Sandeep Maraj, to, who is the Associate Dean for Distance Education Projects and Planning. He's also the head of Entrepreneurship and Business Transformation Office and the coordinator of the Pre-Health Professions Program here at the Faculty of Medical Sciences. I'm going to invite Dr. Maraj to introduce 
Professor D'Souza. Dr. Marad, over to you. Yes, a pleasant good afternoon all. And it's a really great pleasure and honor actually to introduce somebody I met in 2009. And since then, he has grown leaps and bounds. Um, not some, something I would aspire to eventually. Professor Martin de Souza has a BS in pharmacy from the University of Bombay, followed by a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. Professor de Souza actually has the de Souza Nanotechnology Lab, actually based at Mercer University where he's the director of postgraduate studies as well. Professor D'Souza works in the design of novel patented nanotechnologies for delivery of nano vaccines via the oral route, buccal and parental, as well as micro needles to deliver vaccines via the transdermal route, something we'll hear about today. He has also worked on the influenza vaccine, HIV, HPV, bacterial vaccines, as well as pneumonia, meningitis, TB, typhoid, and cancer vaccines. And he has a very interesting uh, proposition for you all when it comes to cancer vaccines, uh, being recently having one, uh, one patented and also, in, and this is entrepreneurship, currently being commercialized. Uh, Professor D'Souza has also been working with the NIH and beyond working with the NIH, he has been working assiduously when it comes to the delivery systems for COVID-19 nano vaccines. Professor D'Souza, with not much further ado, I wish to thank you and welcome you here this evening so that you can talk to us and give us more information on your work, which we are very happy to hear about, Prof. Over to you, Prof. I wanna begin by uh, expressing my gratitude to all of you for these really warm words of welcome. I've been associated with the University of West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago for many, many years. And I've enjoyed that interaction over the years. And I always look forward to, to making the trip there, but these days it's gonna be mainly virtual. Uh, so, uh, so with that, I'll, I'll begin my uh, talk. So today I'm gonna to focus mainly on nano vaccines uh, uh, using uh, a very different system uh, so we've heard a lot about the COVID-19 uh, vaccines recently and all the, you know, the issues with storage conditions, so on and so forth. And so one of the things that uh, my lab was interested in doing is to uh, take it a little past this point. Uh, you know, the, the vaccines that we have right now are fine, but really very difficult to use in, in developing countries and, and especially in many parts of the world that really can't maintain this cold storage conditions. So my lab has uh, over the years been focusing mainly on trying to put out vaccines of a different profile. Vaccines that are very thermal, thermostable and that can be uh, administered without much uh, you know, clinical effort, so to speak. And so uh, one of the good things that really came out of this COVID uh, issue in the, in the last couple of years is uh, the field of vaccines have moved tremendously. I think it has moved what, you know, we were really stuck in a rut. If you look back, uh, vaccines have never evolved for the last hundred years. We were still using this, you know, the stone age technologies of injecting IM vaccines over the years. And so I think with this mRNA vaccine came the first uh, beginnings of a change. And, and with that, I think we, we will see major improvements in vaccines. And, and being in that field, I, I can't tell you how uh, elated I am uh, that this is, uh, has happened. So today I'll focus quite a bit on uh, some COVID-19 vaccines that we've been uh, doing, but also touch briefly on some other uh, infectious disease and cancer vaccine that we've kind of been working on as well. Uh, so as we said, as I said before, uh, if you look, most of these, uh, a whole bunch of these vaccines require, almost all of them need cold storage conditions and some very extreme uh, low temperatures. And then they're all complicated with multiple doses, booster shots, so on and so forth. Uh, 
And as I said, well, one of the good things that will come out of all of this stuff is the, the field of vaccines has got a huge boost in terms of trying to get new uh, strategies and new things on the market. I do sit a lot on several NIH panels, one every month almost, on peer review and, and other government uh, panels. And one thing I have to say is uh, we've seen a lot of new innovations, right from oral dissolving patches to microneedle vaccine patches. And so we can hope to see some of these show up you know, uh, sooner than later. So I'm, I'm very excited about that uh, possibility. So moving on to the main theme of this talk, uh, you know, we, we are all familiar with this uh, COVID pandemic that started or uh, came about sometime around March of 2020. And thereafter, there was the Delta variant and uh, you know that took us by quite a shock. And then uh, of course, uh, I've been telling my colleagues ever since that every three to four months, we can expect a new one. And you know, as, as long as the world, and I mean the world, not just specific countries, the world is not fully vaccinated. We are going to continue to see new uh, mutants show up periodically. And we'd be lucky if it gives us a gap of six months each time. Having said that, uh, really no one knows, uh, most, most of the time uh, variants are worse than the previous one because uh, it, it basically improves itself. That's the nature of viruses in general. And you really never see a, a weakened virus too often uh, as it evolves. So as, as as this one that came about, uh, the Omicron one is basically showing the same potential. It has 15 amino acid changes in the receptor binding domain. And that binding domain is the one that uh, attaches itself to the ACE2 receptors on several different organs. And I'll show you that in just a moment. With that, we also see some other changes in the spike one and spike two part of it, leading to increased transmissibility. Uh, and as though all of this is not enough, it further complicates it because there are several labs have already identified and said that they have to now change the established PCR assays, which we were using all along. And so we may have to also come up because many, many of these may not even be picked up quite easily. So we are you know, everything is now complicated by the fact that we may not be able to pick it up in, in infected individuals as well. Uh, so with that, we know that all of these uh, are related to one main mechanism of action where the spike one protein binds to the ACE2 receptors uh, that are on the cell surfaces. And, and this is the main route by which the, the entire process takes place. Having said that, let's look at ACE2 expression. As you can see, I mean, it's everywhere. There are ACE2 receptors in the central nervous system, upper airways in pretty much the entire vasculature, the lungs, of course, liver, the gut, kidneys, heart, and even the eyes. So as you can see, uh, uh, you know, a person getting infected by that may recover, but there are all kinds of underlying uh, factors that may affect you years later after all of this is gone. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of the individuals appear like they are, they are normal. And then I've seen many, many cases where they have uh, issues with their heart, which they were perfectly normal before that. And suddenly those are getting manifested, you know, months later, sometimes a year later. So again, all this is very complicated by the fact that we have ACE2 receptors everywhere. And, and that is the, the main way in which this can spread. In terms of vaccine, there's no shortage of the different types of vaccines that are being investigated, right from viruses to nucleic acid, protein-based vac vaccines and viral vector, uh, vectors. 
So that's the good news. I think everyone is, uh, every, you know, we are not putting all our eggs in one basket. We're spreading it out, trying different routes and different methods so that in, in the event that one fails, hopefully we have other options. So one of the things that uh, my lab has been uh, interested is in, in, in basically designing and developing nano vaccines. So one of the things that we, we know that when we administer a vaccine, they are pretty much intramuscular IM injections where the body reacts pretty reasonably. But as we said, one of the issues with uh, uh, regular vaccine suspensions is they are, they are highly unstable. And so you need all these cold chains and stuff like that that are very difficult to maintain. So one thing that we've been doing is we make these biodegradable nanoparticles or microparticles. And these are simple, uh, you know, uh, biodegradable matrices that sometimes are made of albumin, beta cyclodextrin, polyvinyl alcohol, polylactic glycolic acid. This is the same material that surgical sutures are made of. And also some sugars. So in other words, we can make these uh, solid particles, uh, you know, and within those particles, we can add adjuvants, we can add the vaccine antigens, and we can also add multiple vaccine antigens. There are no restrictions on that because again, since they are solid, and when once it's made, they all dry solid particles, there are no uh, interactions that can possibly occur once they are dry. So that's the big advantage. So you can put three or four or five different antigens within the same vaccine matrix. And as we said, one, one of the advantages is it's a, it's a dry powder and so no cold chain is needed. We've done stability studies for years now showing no degradation because we totally dehydrated. Uh, uh, and I, I'll talk more about how it's formulated. And so they are extremely stable to, you know, to room temperatures basically for years. One of the things that we do is we make it by a spray drying process and I'll show you that design. Uh, and this, we use a commercial spray drying uh, equipment that can be scaled up from the bench in the lab to huge manufacturing facilities without any further modifications. Our proposal in this particular study is to make a Band-Aid patch much like you see out here. So essentially you just press the patch onto the, uh, onto the arm, the needle dissolves within about two or three minutes, and then you can simply pull the patch out or you can just leave the Band-Aid in place. It doesn't really matter. Uh, big advantage, it can be self-administered, very stable. You don't need any trained technician or trained clinician to do that. Uh, so it, it makes delivery very easy. So here are some of the differences. If you look at a typical subcutaneous or intramuscular needle, a regular hypodermic needle that we all used to seeing and, and terrified of, uh, this is what happens. The needle goes right through the skin, right through all of these blood vessels and stuff and the nerves are all down here. And so that's why we, these are associated with huge amounts of pain. On the other hand, if you look at the micro needles, they go within the top two surfaces, the epidermal and the uh, dermis layers, but really don't get anywhere close to the nerve endings, which are way down here. One of the nice things that occurs is in this area, there are a large array of dendritic cells and Langerhan cells. These are what we refer to as immune cells or antigen presenting cells. If we present the vaccines to these cells out here, these cells are specialized to pick up vaccine antigens and then take it through the lymphatic system, through the lymph ducts into the spleen and there, thereby expand uh, the immune response. So there's, there's a lot of advantage here. It's not crossing into the blood, none of this stuff uh, and no pain whatsoever. So it's delivered where we need it to go rather than where we don't want it to go. Uh, here are some examples, some uh, uh, scanning electron microscope images of a microneedle array. 
as you can see, they're really sharp. And this is the entire array that, that sits on the, on the Band-Aid patch. And this is when it's applied to the individual. So again, very simple in its concept. In our uh, group, we've tried to look at two different proteins. We didn't want to put all our uh, eggs in one basket. So in one, in one prototype, we looked at the spike S1 protein. And in the second one, we took the whole SARS-CoV-2 virus and used the heat inactivated one. So in other words, it's simply a dead virus, but it has all the epitopes of the entire SARS-CoV-2 virus. So there are pluses and minus to each of these. In this case, should the, uh, the virus mutate and the S1 protein you know, mutate too much, uh, in the second prototype, we don't have to worry about it because it's the entire virus. All we are doing is simply heat inactivating it and then incorporating it into microparticles and then into the microneedles. And we'll talk more about that. So in terms of overall study design, we formulate the vaccine, we go on to characterize it. We do some in vitro testing, and then finally we do in vivo testing to make sure that it's active as well. In terms of the overall formulation, as I said, a very simple design. This is a Buki spray dryer. It's a commercially available one, uh, a spray dryer that we made some, some minor modifications to the cooling system here. Uh, but essentially, this is the flask and you can connect this tubing to a huge uh, sterile system. You can place this entire thing in a laminar flow hood if you want to maintain 100% sterility, uh, so on and so forth. And then the particles are sprayed here and then it, it's collected into this cyclone separator into this container. And here you can add a large container, small container, depending on the need. So again, this is a continuous automated process. This, there's no batch to batch variation because there's no physical handling of it. Everything is set and automated. As I said, we then look at uh, characterizing the particles for all of these things. And uh, as you can see, the, the yield is pretty high, 96, over 90% over in all cases. Encapsulation efficiency of the, the, the vaccine itself is also excellent. We can change the size based on what we need. We can make small ones, large ones, all kinds of things. For, typically for vaccines, we don't want them to be too small because it would release it too quickly. Uh, we want a medium size between 0. Uh, 0.5 microns to about 1.5 microns. In doing that, it would release its vaccine antigen payload over a given timeline. And that's exactly what we want. We want some sustained release profile uh, from the vaccine itself. This is a, a scanning electron microscope image showing the uh, uniformity of the particles. And, and we can do this repeatedly and we get pretty much the same thing. So one of the things that we wanted to look for is uh, it's the overall release profile of the spike protein once it's in the uh, microparticles. And we get a release half-life of about 50 hours, around two days. So that looks like a pretty decent, but there's some burst effect, some quick release here, and then there's a slower release later. All of this is good because we want, we want the immune system to get activated fairly quickly, but then we want it to linger on for, for a while in order to get the best possible effect. One of the things, of course, we always do is we look for the toxicity of these microparticles. We want to make sure that they are non-toxic. And uh, in order to do that, we incubate these microparticles or, or these nano vaccines uh, uh, you know, with different uh, concentrations. And DMSO is our standard. It's a pretty toxic compound, so it, it kills the cells. And we look at cell viability here. And as you can see, even at very high doses, we get literally no cell death with the vaccine particles compared to the cells which are not treated with anything. So it's completely, uh, completely uh, non-toxic. 
So here's uh, an interesting thing. So one of the things that we do, and we've developed this system in our lab. Uh, so rather than test a vaccine formulation in hundreds of animals and uh, you know mice and rats and guinea pigs and so on and so forth, including primates, we've developed in-house a system wherein we can test the potency of our vaccine formulation without having to do in vivo testing. Okay, and th this is a major advantage because now we don't have to have all these large number of animals. So in this, in this uh, setup, we take antigen presenting cells, which are dendritic cells, which we can grow in culture and we can get human dendritic cells, murine dendritic cells, so on and so forth. So we have these dendritic cells and then we expose the dendritic cells to our nano vaccines. Okay, so these are the microparticles or nanoparticles containing the vaccine antigen. And it can have the adjuvants, so on and so forth. Once these are taken up by the dendritic cells, we get what we refer to as an innate immune response. That's a very quick response when the body is ex sees any bacteria. That's the first thing that happens. You get a quick innate immune response. And what you notice out here is one of the uh, early markers or indicators of a, of a response, an innate response, is nitric oxide. So the, these dendritic cells generate and produce nitric oxide that then starts to break down these vaccine particles. Then the, the, the entire process of an antigen can go two, by two routes, one, the other or both, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. So uh, one of the routes it can go through is what we refer to as the TH1 pathway. So in this case, the, the vaccine antigen is presented onto the surface of the antigen presenting cell, which is a dendritic cell. And in the presence of the co-stimulatory molecule like CD80 or 86, it can then present this vaccine antigen on the surface to cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells. If it goes to that pathway, it's referred to as a TH1 pathway or an MHC class one because the MHC class one molecule is expressed here with the co-stimulatory molecule out here. And then we get what we refer to as a cytotoxic response, which are mainly CD8 positive T cells. On the other hand, as an alternative, you can also get what we refer to as the TH2 pathway, uh, which involves the co-stimulatory molecule CD40 in conjunction with MHC class two. If this occurs, then we get activation of helper CD4 positive T cells. These are mainly responsible for antibody formation. Okay, so in one case, you can get cytotoxic, CD8 positive T cells or helper CD4 positive T cells. And once these are initiated as part of the innate immune response that occurs pretty fast, then that can trigger the adaptive immune response, so on and so forth, which we talk about later. Having said that though, if the vaccine does not generate one of these responses, if there's no nitric oxide, no TH1, no TH2 in this setup, then we, we are really looking at a pretty poor vaccine formulation. Okay, so if you continue to test that in vivo, the chances of that being effective is close to zero. So by developing this in-house system, we are able to screen a whole series of vaccine formulations rather inexpensively. And, uh, and all of this is cell, in cell cultures. So we can screen you know, tens of these uh, in, in a matter of, of a couple of months, really, uh, versus doing all these in vivo studies that are very, very expensive. Uh, so once that happens, then we can basically look at the nitrite. This is an early response, as I said. So we look at the nitrite, which are released immediately if there's a good immune response. And as a positive control, we use the marketed measles vaccine. That's our positive control. So we look for some response there. The take home message here is, if you look at the virus 
suspension by itself, we get a response, pretty strong response. When we microencapsulate or we put them in microparticles, you, the same virus dose gives you a much higher response. Here we then combine it with alum as well. And alum is just used as a, uh, an adjuvant. And then in the last one, we use two different adjuvants, alum and MF59. Both of these adjuvants are approved by the FDA. So one thing that we've done over the years is we've basically made sure that we've, we use only approved adjuvants, FDA approved adjuvants, because we don't want to complicate the whole scene. Uh, this is not a good time to be looking for new adjuvants. And we have plenty that work quite well. Uh, so you, the take home message here is this response is literally double of the marketed measles vaccine. So as you can see by simply encapsulating the virus in a particle and using just standard adjuvants that are commercially used currently in most vaccines, you can get twice the response for the same dose. Likewise, in that in vitro study, as we said, we look for MHC1 and CD80 response. And we are again, we are looking at the TH1 cytotoxic T cell response. And the take home message here is the last group again, which is the virus encapsulated with alum and MF59 in both these cases, you get the highest response. Uh, compared to any of the other groups. And same thing we get for the TH2 pathway. Uh, this last group is at least equal to, and in most cases, slightly higher than each of its individual components. Uh, in all cases, you may not get both TH1 and TH2 response. So keep that in mind. For cancer vaccines, it's preferred that we get a cytotoxic T cell response. In other words, the TH1 pathway is preferred because we want those type cytotoxic T cells to go and kill the cancer vaccines. For infectious disease, one or the other is fine. In, in our case, we get a, a, a slightly better response for the TH2 pathway. So in other words, we know it's, it's generating, it's going to generate antibody response, but what's What's even nicer is that we get a strong cytotoxic T cell response. So in other words, we get potent T cells that will go and wipe out the virus. This is a, always a highly uh, preferred route. And it's preferred simply because it's cytotoxic T cells are very, very vigilant and they can uh, pretty much clear the virus very fast. So, one of the advantages that we've seen in microparticles or nano vaccines is in all cases, we generate what we refer to as a TH1 and TH2 pathway. So both pathways are activated, which is really nice, which we don't typically get with simple IM injections. We get a very weak response there. One of the, another in the nice way we, uh, we can, uh, you know, evaluate our vaccines in vitro is to look for autophagic, autophagic vacuoles. And so in this case, we e expose our uh, uh, nanoparticle vaccines uh, to macrophages or dendritic cells in culture. And if we get autophagic vacuoles, as you can see out here, these by the strong fluorescence, if we get a very strong fluorescence uh, uh, image, compared to the controls or the vac uh, vac uh, particles which do not have the uh, uh, virus or these antigen, uh, then we can say we are also going to get a strong response. So there are quite a few ways we can uh, basically characterize these vaccines formulations in vitro before we test them in vivo. And then once everything is worked out there and we get good uh, responses from our particles, uh, from our vaccine microparticle, we go on to then make the uh, microneedles. And we use, again, for the microneedles, we use a completely uh, automated bio 3D uh, printer. So we basically print these, uh, these microneedles using uh, a completely automated system. Again, no 
uh, you know, manual manipulations along the way. So uh, completely reproducible products in, in each case. And most of our micro needles are made from dissolvable uh, biodegradable polymers, sometimes as simple as mannitol, trehalose, uh, uh, polyvinyl alcohol. So a lot of the sugars are used to make these micro needles. Uh, and the reason we want to do that is uh, uh, they need to dissolve very rapidly once they administer to the uh, skin. So we don't, really don't want them to you know, take two hours or anything like that. The quicker, the better. We do further characterization for the micro needle itself. And we look at uh, dissolution, loading, stability, so on and so forth. And we'll come through some of those. So here's another example of a single micro needle. When we administer it onto the skin, we can see these pore formations out here clearly. We, are, we can also do confocal uh, microscopy using Z-Stack. And in this case, we use a, a dye and we can see how deep these pores are formed. And this one actually gives a better image. So here you can see a microneedle array before and after. So this is two minutes after application onto the mouse skin. And you can clearly see all these needles are completely dissolved after application. And this is what it generates. This is a, a light microscopy image of the microneedle on the skin. And essentially it makes a little dent out here. There's no blood or nothing. You don't even feel it. And this uh, micro, uh, the pore basically closes up in a couple of hours. So it's not open for very long or anything like that. One of the things that we were also interested in is to look and see how long these, uh, the spike protein or the antigen gets released once the micro particles are in the micro needles. And we got a half life of release around two days. And if you recall, and it's out here, the half life of release from the particle itself was around uh, two days. And from the micro needle is also two days. So, in other words, when we put the micro particle within the micro needle, the micro needle is not slowing down the release of the antigen. That's very important. We don't want it to hold back the antigen any. So that was a, a good thing to see. And then we finally went on to do in vivo studies with the best prototype that we had. And here you can see uh, the, 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 these are just uh, IgG levels, the antibody titers uh, with different groups. Uh, so out here, I've broken this up into two. The, all these on the left-hand side here uh, are basically spike one protein. So these are the spike protein. The take-home thing to look at is in the last group out here, okay, at week 12. And when you look at this group here, the spike protein in microparticles and then in, put in two microneedles, okay, at week 12, we got a pretty good response. And really the response came as quick as four weeks. And in all cases, it was, it was better than when the micro needle, uh, when the spike protein was put in microparticles and injected IM. So we were happy to see that the micro needle formulation did better than the traditional particles injected intramuscularly. So that was an interesting thing for us to observe. And quite clearly, the microparticle in turn was better than the one that was just pure suspension of the uh, spike glycoprotein. And likewise, we see exactly the same thing here with the virus. When we look at the virus as well, we, we get this uh, similar kind of thing. Uh, as you can see here, the once they were put in the microneedle, the response was very strong. And, and that was, you know, we, we really need to see that. We stopped these studies at week 12 because we were pretty happy that the, the response was stronger in all cases. All right, so that was uh, the, uh, the spike uh, and, you know, the virus thing for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, vaccine. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll just briefly talk about some of the other studies that we've been working with over the years. And so we, uh, we also developed, uh, we've been working on an influenza, universal influenza virus. Uh, and and that, were, you know, that project was recently completed. And again, part of an NIH uh, funded study. And in that case, uh, we were looking at the M2 protein. So the M2 protein in influenza viruses are common within all the virus categories. So basically we uh, uh, used the M2 protein and we used VLP, virus-like particles of the M2 protein as the viral antigen. And, uh, and again, we got excellent result. This was a collaboration between uh, several individuals from Georgia State, Emory University and Georgia Tech, all of the three other universities in the Atlanta area. And we also were, have been working on an RSV vaccine. Currently, there are no good RSV vaccines. And in this case, we are using the fusion protein, the F protein, which again is, uh, is responsible uh, for fusion between the virus and the host cells. Similarly, we are working using the VLPs of this F protein. Okay, and again, just in an attempt to uh, get it to induce a stronger response. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to make a quick mention in the past, about five years ago, I completed a study uh, uh, using ovarian cancer and we designed an ovarian cancer vaccine. Uh, I have to, I was happy to say that that was then licensed to Keromic Biopharma, uh, and a company in Houston, Texas. And basically they will be starting the phase one study of the first of its kind uh, uh, vaccine uh, sometime in early next year. So, uh, so that is, those are some of the things. And in that particular thing, we are just, we are using a series of antigens that we've identified, uh, SP17 and several proteins and DNA, uh, prototypes that uh, were isolated from ovarian cancer patients. And that would be a cocktail of different uh, antigens that will be used in that particular vaccine formulation. With that, I, nothing is possible without, uh, you know, I think if we, I've graduated over 60 plus PhD students over the years, and I couldn't really do anything without them as I, uh, you know, as I say, I'm a, I'm a really good typist, uh, but these are the guys who really do all the wonderful work in the lab and they are just amazing students. I couldn't do anything without them. Uh, and nothing would be possible because without funding from the National Institutes of Health that have been, you know, with me for years and years now, and I've been able to, you know, get a lot of my funding, pretty much all of my funding for these vaccine studies from them. With that, I would like to open it up for questions. And uh, let me stop sharing my screen, see how we do that. All right, okay, so uh, I think you can, uh, I guess you can type the question in the chat box. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Professor D'Souza. So I did see a few questions coming for you. Um, there, there was quite a bit of sharing of location and names going on while you were delivering, everybody was interacting. So let me give you some of the questions. It might take a little while if you are scrolling through to find them. So I started off for you. So we had a question that said, do you see this method being effective for all categories of people, example, children in which the lymphatic system, Langerhan cells are not developed properly yet? So yeah, the answer to that is, uh, I, I wouldn't say that in very young children, uh, you know, that the system is basically not developed at that point. Because in, in all these cases, we are taking advantage and we do need the complete development of the lymphatic system. So no, I would say in, in 
let's say the infant and uh, newborn, uh, I wouldn't say that that's, uh, that would be applicable at that stage. But once they you know, get past four or five years old, I think from that point onwards, uh, once the immune system has uh, you know, matured and have started to develop, uh, it would be viable at that stage, yes. Okay, thanks, Prof. Another question that came in was, is it that, I think it was a follow-on as well, is it that the, um, the efficacy of this nanotechnology would be comparable to standard methods for COVID-19, that is average six months and therefore another micro-needle shot needed after a particular period of time? Okay, so that's a good question. And so we did a follow-up study, uh, you know, with, uh, Basically, uh, in, in all cases, we used a prime, in, a, in other words, the initial one followed by one booster. And, uh, and we did need the booster in, in pretty much all cases. Uh, having said that, we, uh, we didn't, you know, we don't know if we didn't use the booster, would the titers have still been the same, but we did not want to take any chances because these were the initial studies that we were doing. And so we did use a prime followed by a booster in, in all cases. Okay. All right, uh, thanks, Prof. We have the questions rolling in crazily now. <laughs> um, they're all coming in fast and furious. Why are nasal vaccines important? So, uh, so, so one of the things that we see in, in, in this particular case, uh, you know, at least with the COVID vaccine, uh, uh, so I think the question was why are nasal vaccines important, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, one of the best methods one could come up, uh, at least for COVID, is a mucosal vaccine. And so nasal delivery is a mucosal delivery system uh, one of the things that uh, I think we probably will see evolve in the in the next few uh, you know months and and probably within the year uh, are basically a, a, a nasal vaccines much like we had the flu mist where you inhale the vaccine uh, that would be the best kind because this particular virus enters the system through the nasal cavity in other words it's a you know it, it enters through the airways. If you can develop an immune response that is mucosal or through the you know, respiratory tract, that would be the best kind because you would have a strong antibody response literally in you know, days or hours after any exposure. So I think there is a, there's a lot of uh, emphasis towards that. Uh, at this point, they could go with the most conventional one, so they didn't have to waste much time. But I, I know that there are many companies who are, who are working on nasal vaccines for COVID too as well. Okay. All right, so another question. Can spray drying, can spray drying affect the composition of spike protein and hence decrease its efficacy? Yeah, so that's a great point. So one of the uh, advantages in the method that we use, as I said, we modified this, uh, you know, the nozzle, the spray nozzle. And in this particular spray nozzle, we cool it down to minus 10 degrees centigrade. So in other words, the, the spray nozzle itself is very cold. So all uh, so it, it does not get exposed to any heat during that time. The only transient heat that it gets exposed to is when it's going through the chamber. And that literally goes through in, in, in seconds. So, and we've done many, many examples of enzymes and, and antigens and proteins and tested them before and after, and we've got no degradation, not even a, uh, not even a 5% degradation. So no, we've, we've done this and we've been using this prototype for I would say at least 15 years now. And we've tested all kinds of different proteins, enzymes, very, very thermal sensitive enzymes, and we've had no degradation. Very interesting, very interesting. All right, okay, so 
this, this question, the person who's asking it is assuming that the micrometers are not hollow. How are the microparticles incorporated into the micrometers? And okay. It's yeah. a three part. It's a three parts. So Let me run through all three parts and then you can tell me what you need me to repeat. If the heat needles are hollow, is there a reservoir in the patch? And as the microparticles are a dry powder, is there potential for local inflammatory whaling of reaction and not mounting a systemic antibody response as such? Okay, excellent question. Very good technical question. So, uh, so the answer to the first part is no, they are not hollow needle, they are solid in, in nature. And the, so the way we do that is uh, in this, uh, you know, in, in the bioprinter that makes the micro needle, we use a suspension of the material for the micro needle. In other words, most of those are sugars. And then we mix, we suspend the micro particles within the, that sugar suspension. And, and that is then basically formulated or poured into the micro needles. It's formulated into the micro needles. So to answer that, it's completely uh, a solid micro needle and not a hollow structure. And as we said, because the micro needles are made up of these biodegradable polymers, they create no a uh, rash or no redness or no interaction per se uh, whatsoever. No different than administering, let's say, an intramuscular injection because they are, it's exactly the same material. They are completely biodegradable and non-reactive uh, non in, in the sense that there's, there's no itching or any of that stuff. That's, that's excellent. Oh, okay. How do you regulate and guarantee stability of the nanoparticles? Yeah, so so one of the things is uh, once the uh, so one of the advantages of the nanoparticles is that once it's formed, uh, it is hundred percent dry. So if you recall the schematic of the spray dryer, the it's a solution, and once it's sprayed, out comes the dry form. And once it's dry, we just leave it in a, a vacuum desiccator overnight uh, to take out any possible trace amounts of moisture that could possibly be left behind after the spray drying process. So in other words, it's a completely dry uh, microparticle at the end of the process. So there is no contact with moisture anymore from that point. And being a particle, again, it is sealed in nature. So it's mm -hmm. all closed up. Mm -hmm. So we did not, in fact, we were surprised. We did not even have to store it under, under nitrogen conditions or any of that. We just left it for, for many of our stability studies. At, even at room temperature, we just let, let it sit in a while at room temperature and different conditions, temperatures open without even closing it. We just wanted to see, you know, does air impact it? Uh, but there is no moisture. So the, if there's no moisture, there's very little chance of it interacting. And again, keep in mind, the vaccine is protected into this particle. So it's a closed seal system. Closed seal system. Well, very easy for delivery, as you have said. And I guess the transportation as well, it's, it's in remote areas depending on where um, it's needed. Right. Okay, now the question to you. What testing method is there for investigating the innate immune response to any particular microbe? Can you go one more time on that? I missed part of it. What testing method is there for investigating the innate immune response to any particular microbe? Okay, so, so one of the things that we, I showed is that exposure to dendritic cells in culture uh, you know, the, that all of that is that the entire innate immune response that we are looking at and we are testing is completely done using dendritic cells mm -hmm. in culture. Uh, and that is probably one of the easiest way to do it because as I said, if there is no innate immune response, in other words, if there's no nitric oxide and there's no uh, TH1, TH2 response, 
chances are that vaccine is not going to be very effective. Very rarely have we, in fact, we have never come across that where we've seen a vaccine that did not produce an innate response in vitro went on to create a strong immune response in vivo. Uh, because really the innate immunity leads on to uh, you know, the full-blown uh, systemic immunity as well. So we do need the innate immune response to show up or else it's not worth testing it in vivo. Professor, this is where I'm going to ask you just one more question because I notice it's now 12.56 and we need to wrap up for one o'clock. So the last question to you for you is, some nettle plants that exist in nature, right? There's some nettle plants that exist in nature. Would you say that that is an example of nanoparticle injection and microneedle system? Oh, uh, I missed the, the first part, uh, some- Nettle, nettle? Oh, nettle plants, okay. Nettle plants, yes. yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so plants, you know, do have uh, a lot of uh, stuff that they express and they are, they function essentially like nanoparticles. Absolutely. In fact, there are, there are a couple of companies that are making these vaccines in plants, that are expressing these vaccines in plants. They haven't figured out yet how to, they, they could extract the vaccines that are generated in a completely plant-based system, uh, but they are unable to maintain the uniformity and the reproducibility of batch-to-batch -batch systems. Uh, so there's a company in the Baltimore area in Maryland that uh, uh, I think it's Fran Hoffer, it's a German company that uh, operates in Germany and in the US as well. And they make 90% of their vaccines in plants. And uh, it, it was amazing. Actually, one of my graduate students did a postdoc out there and it was fascinating to me. But yes, you can actually uh, generate these in plants. It's a lot more challenging, but, but it can be done. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor D'Souza. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close off the question and answer at this point. Thank you all for such engaging questions. And I'm going to hand over now for the vote of thanks to Professor Sureshwar Pandey, who is Professor in Pharmaceutical Studies at the Faculty of Medical Sciences here at the St. Augustine campus. And when Professor Pandey is finished, I will come back and just do a wrap up in two sentences. Professor Pandey. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marsa. Um, words are not enough to express the gratitude for the delivery of such a wonderful topic that is a nano vaccine delivery by a band aid like micro needle patch. Prof. Professor Martin D'Souza, Excellent, excellent work. I think for this delivery and for your work, I profusely thank in person and on behalf of this organization, you have done a wonderful job, enlightened us with your work. Uh, I understand this work was done not in a day, for quite some time you have been working on this, uh, um, uh, dinoparticles and uh, uh, micro needle delivery. So thank you very much, Prof, for your enlightened talk. I express my gratitude and thanks to uh, Professor Simia for his remark, opening remark, Dr. Sandeep Maharaj for his organizational capacity and to bring this uh, talk uh, lunch and talk, uh, and I hope it will continue and wish it will continue. I also thank the host and the co-hosts for um, uh, this presentation, they, their interest to uh, organize and uh, 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 the lunch and talk. I, I will fail in my duty without expressing my thanks to all the participants 
who at these odd hours of lunchtime from 12 to 1, they have participated and have paid attention. A special thanks to those who had queries and questions to clarify the doubts. If I have missed anyone, I feel sorry for them, but it doesn't mean that I do not thank. Thank you one and all friends. And Professor D'Souza has always helped us by several ways. So to him, salute and thanks, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, yes, Professor please. Pandey. Thanks, Professor Pandey. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at the end of the lecture. Thank you so much for joining us. We trust that this was very enlightening and informative for you. We are going to be posting the recording of this lecture online. The link is in the chat for you to access. It won't be up today, but it will be up in a few days time. And you can always check our link to see um, the lecture. Thank you again for being such a wonderful audience. Thank you, Professor D'Souza. Have a wonderful afternoon. And please remember to be safe and follow the guidelines for your respective countries. Good afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you all. My pleasure.